On tonight's Monday Night Travel, we are headed to southern France as we explore Provence with our longtime friend Steve Smith. Among other gems, we'll visit the French Rome of Nîmes, marvel at the medieval walls of Avignon, and appreciate the cultural powerhouse of Aix-en-Provence. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steve Zero. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening as we explore the beauties of Provence. So put your travel dreams in the upright and locked position as we jet off to France. Deep in the south of France, Provence offers a rich palette of travel experiences, scenic, historic, and cultural. It's the ideal region to immerse yourself in the good life of France. And you may just come up a Francophile. A Francophile, he said? <laughs> Everybody, here's our favorite Francophile, Steve Smith. Bonsoir, tout le monde. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, Steve. Uh, let's see, I just have some notes. <laughs> good. Um, our format's a little bit different tonight. Uh, we're going to use Rick's episode as a frame to show you lovely pictures of Provence, but really it's going to be a lot of information verbally from our friend, Steve, because I know he wants to share all of the recent information you got, because you got back from France. Monday night. Monday, a week ago. Uh, right. So you yeah. missed last Monday night travel. Sorry. You can I was on it. the airplane. You can watch it online. <laughs> they are not showing it yet on the uh, Delta flight. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> um, so uh, besides talking, we're going to actually, we've cut out the whole portion of Rich where Rick, where he does his wine tasting in Provence. And we're going to do our own wine tasting live and in person. So I hope that you can join us for that. <laughs> And then before we go back to the video, I just wanted to say, Steve, a Francophile, someone who loves France and all things French, how did you become a Francophile? It started um, against my better wishes. When I was eight years old, my parents made me move to the French part of Belgium, um, where I was sent to Catholic school in French. So we did one of these, my sister and I did one of these Berlitz uh, classes. My dad was an English professor uh, teaching to grad students on the Fulbright program back in the early 60s. I'm dating myself. <laughs> and, and, um, and then, and we lived there for a year and a half then, and then in the uh, southwest part of France for a year. And I was forced to speak French and to adjust. And you do at that age. You know, it's, it's funny. I, boy, I, I remember missing my baseball glove, baseball bat, and trading it for a soccer ball. Right. Yeah. yeah. And training also American friends for French friends that kept my language alive when we moved back to the States, because I think I was 10 when we moved back, fourth or fifth grade, whatever that was. And they kept coming to visit because we lived in Southern California and the Frenchies wanted to see Hollywood. Oh, yeah. The beach, Malibu, all that stuff. And so I kept uh, being host uh, and translating for mom and dad when the adults and the kids would come to visit. And it just kept going from there. So when did your dad learn to speak French? He didn't. <laughs> oh, he did. When we bought the house in Burgundy 35 years ago, uh, dad is a, um, he's got a good mind and uh, he practiced and he self-taught. Yeah. And he does well. Even it, he's still alive at almost 98. He's still there with me uh, when we're there. And he does really, reason really remarkably well. That's fantastic. So we will be coming at this show tonight from the viewpoint of a Francophile, a yes, fluent you. French speaker, the man who knows everything. <laughs> and my food French is fluent, but the rest of my French is not. So we're also going to be coming at it from an English speaker and how that will translate to the folks in our audience who don't speak French. And you've been a Francophile, I know, because I've known you a long time. So you've got good knowledge too. I want to hear about it too. Okay. All right. Well, let's start this show and we'll be back in just a few minutes. We'll marvel at an ancient aqueduct, savor Côte du Rhône wine in its birthplace, experience the quintessential Provençal market, play a little boule, follow in the footsteps of Van Gogh, and dodge bulls in a 2,000-year-old arena. France is nearly as big as Texas. The region of Provence stretches from the Mediterranean coast up the Rhône River Valley. We'll cross the Pont du Gard, sip our way through the Côte du Rhône wine region, and explore the cities of Nîmes, Arles, Avignon, and Aix-en-Provence. 
While its cities are packed with important sites, Provencal life feels rooted in its countryside, small towns, and vibrant markets. Its famous fields of lavender and sunflowers inspire painters. Its howling mistral wind can, as they say, blow the ears off a donkey. And its coveted Côte de Rhone wines showcase this region's confident mastery of good living. And around here, good living is never far from nature. Where else can you canoe through such charming scenery and then under a nearly 2,000-year-old aqueduct? This region's evocative Roman ruins make history part of the picnic. Part of the picnic. Okay, this is, I mean, I told you we weren't going to get too far into the episode. Um, so I did this with my family. Um, I know you've done this many times. It's very easy to be in the outdoors in France. I think Oh, yeah. when we talk about France, you know, so many of us just think of Paris. And to me, France is the most outdoorsy country in Western Europe. You're a big outdoors person. Yeah, it's my it, France is where the Europeans go. I mean, it's the most common place to go for your whitewater rafting, kayaking. Um, the highest mountain peaks in Europe are in uh, Western Europe, that is, I've learned, uh, are in France. Um, and there's lots of open space. Uh, and the the nature is phenomenal. There's in this mm -hmm. in Provence, which we're not going to see on the video tonight, but is uh, the hilltop town of Roussillon, mm -hmm. and right next to or part of Roussillon is where they mined ochre mm -hmm. before World War II, and so you can walk into it's a park, right? Yeah, like it park. is. Yeah, you can walk into this park and be completely surrounded by these ochre cliffs. It's just gorgeous and it looks a little bit like a favorite place of yours in the u.s it does <laughs> southern utah yeah good call lisa <laughs> yes it is it's it's very yeah there's a familiar color and feel to it it it, it is francis it's a good point you make and i hadn't thought of that um more than a great country for cities and villages and roman monuments and great art impressionist art gothic art romanesque art it's tops in france but it's also a place where people really go to seek nature there's so many hiking trails that cross the country the grand randonnée and and the brits love that kind of thing walk village to village they'll cross the whole country commonly yeah in two weeks or anyway it's a popular place to be outdoors just as you say and i just wanted to note that uh, we were showing in the video the canoeing under the Pont de Gare. And I did this with my family, with my daughter. She was eight at the time. Yeah, she was She was seven. Actually, she was seven at the time, another family. So we had kids seven, nine, 11, and 12. And I don't, I mean, I told you that I don't speak much French and I had to call and make the reservation. I only had to call one day before. Is that still the truth? Can you call the day before and get a canoe rental? Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Just, yeah. 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 And in fact, the same thing, by the way, I'll take this a different, a big deal. One thing that Rick and I realized we were 10 days together, eight days together on the Riviera, but that applies elsewhere in France too, is calling a day ahead for lots of things now and a restaurant in particular. So many of the restaurants that are really good that we recommend now are small places. Mm -hmm. And because of COVID, I think in part, they're really limiting the number of people. But if you just show up, call or walk by the day before, even the afternoon of, if they're open still, make a reservation. It's it's almost anywhere you can get in. So we're, so we're gonna talk about this more in depth too, about how hotels can really help with this. Right. But it was very interesting since you brought this up, I was traveling around with some friends earlier this year and they're very curious interested mm. people and so we would go past the restaurant and they'd say how what do we do how do right. we get in so if you my answer is if you walk up to a restaurant you sort of stand if it's an outdoor cafe you stand near the aisle um, if it's an indoor you go yeah. and sort of stand near the door and you wait to be acknowledged right. and ask if there's a table yeah. does that is that the truth in France? How do you do it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if there's a few people in front of you, you do it the same as in the United States, really. The first thing you do, though, is the book, by law, the menu has to be posted outside. So always look for the menu and make sure the price range and try to see the wine list, too, if you can. But generally, the wine prices relate or, or corresponding to the price of the food and make sure it's what you want. It's on the menu. The, this is also happening in France a lot. More this year, and I think it's a post-COVID thing too, more limited selection. Menus are smaller, tighter. Oh. So you may have two or three choices for starter and main course, whereas before it may, may have been five or six or seven or eight, whatever. So make sure that they have what, what's on the menu tonight. It's what you want. And then, yes, yeah, stand in line. And they may say, we're full. Désolé. Sorry, we're full. And you would say, demain, 
Ah, but by yeah. the way, no matter what you do, everybody out there, any conversation with any Frenchman, start with bonjour, madame, or bonjour, monsieur, or at least bonjour. I don't care if it's nighttime. That still works. You can say bonsoir if you want to be sophisticated, but just acknowledging that is so important to the French. Um, and I'll do that sometimes. Have I told you about this, Lisa? I'll, I'll, I'll go up to somebody and ask for directions without saying bonjour first, and they'll look at me and they'll say, bonjour. Oh, yes. And it's sort of yes. like, ooh, sorry, I should know better. Yeah, I should know better. Yeah. So anyway. I tell my tour members that, you know, we as Americans, we like to get down to business. We don't want to waste anybody's exactly. time. So you're we're very, so you know, quick. But when you're speaking to a French person, you must always acknowledge them as a human before you get down to business. And I don't mean to sound preachy, mm -hmm. but just, you know, you know, bonjour, monsieur. And then may I ask you a question or do you speak English? But I'll say too, Lisa, that part of this is in the South and we are in the South tonight in, in Provence, it's more laid back. So if you're going to Provence, uh, it it's compared to Paris, it's not night and day, but it won't be quite so, uh, so you know, a reaction you might get that you would get in the North. And if you think that French people are not friendly, you're just wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry your neighbor had a bad experience yeah. with a waiter in Paris once, but the French are delightful. You just you just have to know the differences. Sometimes our cultural differences are mm -hmm. sort of diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Franco-American love affair is alive and well. I can tell that by the bagel shops. What Paris. Americans need to know, two things that I think are important. First of all, there are three things. They're formal to quieter, right? They, they don't walk down the street saying hi to people they don't know. That used to be the first sign of senility in France was talking out loud to people you didn't know. And Americans, of course, were famous for that. They find Americans like have a nice day, a little bit superficial, which it is. It, it, and and it's, But it's less like that now. Um, but they love the American accent on their language. Did you know that, Lisa? I did not. Uh, no. And now think, I want you guys to think. It's true. Uh, we love a French accent. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, <laughs> exactly. Like Inspector Clouseau. It's similar. Now, they don't like the German accent or the Dutch accent on their uh, language, but the American accent, I think they, I, I know, they think is cute. Um, anyway, there you go. Okay. So don't be fearful of trying. No. Bonjour, madame. Not. Bonjour, monsieur. I, um, I just got back, as you know, from three months, and I spent several days in, the, in their Grand Canyon of Verdun, and it's just spectacular. And it's on the edge of Provence. It really connects Provence with the Riviera. It's the greatest way to run between those two, or link those two areas is through the Gorge de Verdun. Have this, you done, this, is, this is where I'm going to try and Have you done this before? No. Okay, oh, it's rare. But in the book, you can actually drive a long part of the Gorge de Verdun As to, a girl, to yeah. go between Provence and the Riviera. Yeah, that's and that's outlined in the book, which you co-authored, tour guide and co-author Steve. Oh, I know what I was going to say to you, part, and I hope this is okay, that I'm I did two tours this year for the first time in a long time and lovely people uh, on these tour groups just and really good people and um I wanted to know how they were treated everybody I think every stop along the way it was they were like updaters for me on on the book stuff just how are you how is, is this what I is what I think true and I think we had 24 people on each tour or something and to a person that they had good experiences with the French on a daily basis that makes me feel good it's not just me you know, interpreting things. And, no, that's true. And, but I assume that you would equip them with good etiquette. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. the French aren't perfect by any means either. Uh, you can run into anybody in a bad day. Of course. Okay. Let's get back to Rick and then we will stop and talk some more. I think they're getting the gist of how much we're going to stop. <laughs> it's great. The Pont du Gard reminds us that throughout the ancient world, aqueducts were stone flags heralding the greatness of Rome. They still proclaim the wonders of that age. This perfectly preserved Roman bridge supported a canal or aqueduct on the very top. It was a critical link, helping keep a steady river of water flowing cross country to Nîmes, one of the Roman Empire's largest cities. Remarkably, the water dropped only one inch for every 350 feet. Let's go inside. This is what Roman aqueducts were all about. This is part of a 30 mile long channel. A man-made river flowed through this for 400 years. You can still see the original stones. 
I'm going to stop it for just one second. You can't still do this, Steve. You can. You the, can? the only way you do it now, it, it in 10 years ago, whatever, 15 years ago, it was open to anybody. Now you have to sign up for a tour. Okay. And it's an hour long tour and it's worth doing, even if it's in French, just for the opportunity to walk through the channel. To walk inside a 2000 yeah. year old aqueduct? Otherwise you won't get inside. You, you can't even peek inside if you don't make your reservation. It's on their website and it's in our book. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank yeah. you a thin layer of mortar that waterproofed the channel, and after centuries of use, a thick mineral buildup. The Pont du Gard's main arch is the largest the Romans ever built, 80 feet across. The bridge itself has no mortar, just ingeniously stacked stones. Taking full advantage of the round arch the Romans invented, it's made strong by gravity. The Pont du Gard Museum shows that a steady supply of water was an essential part of the Roman art of living. You'll see some very old plumbing, walk through a rock quarry, and learn how they moved those huge blocks into place and constructed those massive arches. All this work was designed to bring water into the still grand Roman city of Nîmes. The water finally gushed out here, into this modest-looking distribution tank from where it served the thirsty city's needs. Imagine the jubilation on that day in AD 50 when suddenly the system was operational. This is the very end of the aqueduct, and water would tumble out of this hole and fill this pool. Now, the system was designed to prioritize according to how much water was available. If the water level was high, these holes would send water to the homes of the wealthy, to decorative fountains, and to public baths. But if the water level was very low, well, these holes would still send water to the essential neighborhood wells. Today, the town's many Roman ruins testify to Nîmes' former importance. The Maison Carré rivals Rome's Pantheon as the most complete building surviving from the Roman Empire. The temple survived, in part, because it's been in constant use for the last thousand years. The lettering across the front is long gone, but the remaining nail holes presented archaeologists with a fun challenge. Match the pattern of the nail holes to the letter it once held. And they solved the puzzle. They determined that the temple was built to honor Caius and Lucius, the grandsons of Emperor Augustus. And from that information, they dated the temple to the year 4 AD. Steve, I'm holding <laughs> you back. I know I had a break here for you to talk about Neem, but I, you're just twitching. What, what do you want to say? You were just there. Yeah, I was. And I think I've always thought this, but but I, I spent more time there than usual this year. And I think Neem is one of the great undiscovered cities in France. Also, by the way, I think Strasbourg. I mean, certain places just jump out at me when I go. And they're and less obvious to a lot of Americans, but just brilliant. And it's, it's interesting looking at those images from an old TV show. Those Roman buildings are bright white now. They have been cleaned off beautifully. And that it's so weird to see them looking so um, dark and, you know, and grimy. Oh. The, the Maison Carré and the arena in Nîmes are phenomenal. And all over France, and particularly in monuments like this, they have come up with, they're using technology now. Uh, these fancy little visio guides where you can you know, point it at and they, they'll recreate in three dimensions. Sometimes it works well, and sometimes it's a little hokey, but what they've done in Nîmes at those two monuments is really pretty good. Is this where you put on the virtual reality Sometimes. goggles? It depends I, where you are. I did that at Notre Dame. Oh, isn't that crazy? Week. I had tears in my eyes. That, I was so excited to... I'm glad you did it. Yeah, I got the word out. Um, I think Virginie, my research assistant, discovered that. Um, that's amazing. That's the best there is in, in Paris. People should know about that. Yeah. Okay. So for those of you that are interested and you're going to Paris, I know we're talking about Provence, but I, I was blown away by how much I liked this. So it's, uh, is it Eternel? Yeah. Notre Dame Eternel, which would be Eternal Notre Dame, right in front of the cathedral. Look around for blue banners, we about a hundred yards in front of the cathedral as you'd face it. It's in an old, uh, it's in a parking lot, a garage down below that they've, they've renovated into this amazing 3D Really, and I'm skeptical of that stuff. Yeah. I bet you are too. Yeah. This is stunningly good. You wear a backpack with the battery yeah. and you have the full on. And I've only done virtual reality once, but you start. They're very good. They do it. It's in English. It's all wonderful. Oh, There's a locker for you to put your 
things in and you go inside and the first thing you do is you walk into the medieval world of the cathedral being built and yeah. i did i got tears in my eyes because uh, the, the cathedral is an old friend to a lot of us tour guides and to see it again although the front of notre dame still looks really you know what you can see of it still looks really good it's the up back end of their the goal i mean i think people want to know this their goal is to have here's what steve thinks <laughs> <laughs> their no, their president says by sure by the time the Olympics start in 2024, which is the summer of 2024 next year, it will be completed. I won't. I mo the people in the know say no, but they'll probably be able to walk in a bit, you mm -hmm. know, sort of peek in the main entry, maybe walk in 20 feet. Who knows, really? But uh, they are. If you walk by it now, there's cranes everywhere, and they are uh, full court pressing it to get yeah. that as much done as possible by the Olympics. By the way, Neem. Um, N I M E S. The name comes from. It's kind of fun to know. Uh, uh, they in the uh, 1800s they shipped this cloth, this blue dyed cloth, to the United States and other parts of the world, called denim. Denim is de neem or from neem. That's how we get our na denim name. I, I bet you knew that already because the way you're smiling. <laughs> but it's you know it's more. And there's a little museum that I just love there. I love these little um and throughout. And Rick and I were both sort of enchanted by these lesser museums because a lot of the big museums are so busy now with post-COVID, um, what did Rick call it? He called it um, revenge travel. Mm -hmm. But boy, there's lovely, like Anim is a whole revenge, I mean, a, a, an overlooked city and it's 25 minutes to the Pont du Gard. Uh, anyway, um, the biggest thing though, guys, about Neem is the new Romanity Museum. It is the greatest, and there are great museums of Roman history in France, throughout Southern France, but boy, the one in Neem, I gave it three stars and we rarely are three triangles in our books. That it takes, that's a, an Eiffel Tower, a Louvre Museum, Versailles level of- It's a don't miss. It don't is miss a, it. whatever you do, don't miss it. It's worth, and you don't, you can day trip Neem, by the way, from Arles or Avignon perfectly well. I love spending the night there because it's it's such an old, you will see very few Americans there. Um, and the Roman Museum there is absolutely stunning in every way. It combines brilliant artifacts that they found, over 5,000 just in the city of Nîmes. And Rick was showing us on that video, and it's such a cool spot where the water landed from the Pont du Gar, 44 million gallons a day, 2,000 years ago, and where it was distributed, right? Uh, and so all that stuff is there within the city. And then they've packaged um, a lot of the artifacts that you can put it together in the Roman Museum. Brilliant place. And that is called Rome? And they call it the Romanity Museum. It just, you, the Museum of Roman History. I like the one in Arles too, by the way. That's another great one of Roman History of Arles too. And I will just say, um, <laughs> having only been to Nîmes once, um, but it's interesting to me because you have the Maison Carré, which... Rick just said in the video is one of the best preserved Roman buildings anywhere, you know, outside of the Pantheon, which, you know, just last month you started to need a reservation to get into. Maison oh, wow. Carré, you can walk right in. Yeah. And there's a Roman theater, which, right? The Where's arena. You, the uh, arena. The arena. Yeah. Okay. Where's the theater? Oh, that's an orange. That's orange. We're not going to talk about in the video. So I, it's worth mentioning. I have an image of it. I can't, we can't, don't stop. Oh, that's right. <laughs> don't make me look bad. Uh, but there is a Roman look, theater yeah. in Orange, which looks like orange. The, those, the Pont du Gare and the great Roman theater in Orange and such Roman monuments were left untouched in part because they were just too big to take down and use to, re, you know, to quarry really in the Middle Ages when people were building, uh, using, scavenging stones, as you know, Lisa, from Roman monuments. But these are just too big. So thank God there's many of them in Southern France that are left pretty much intact. The best place to see Roman ruins is in southern, southern France. And there and there are great Roman museums. And I love it when they put it together for me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, look at that. You, I, I don't know if you can hear my voice, but it is beautifully white now. That's great. That's great. I and you, that's you crazy, have to that's great. imagine these buildings also faced with marble back 2,000 years ago. Nîmes Arena, which is still in use, is considered the best preserved from ancient Rome. It's another fine example of Roman engineering and Roman propaganda. In the spirit of give the masses bread and circuses, admission was free. The emperor's agenda was to create a populace that was thoroughly Roman, enjoying the same activities and the same entertainment, all thinking as one. Many travelers visit Nîmes only for its famous Roman sites and are pleasantly surprised by the rest of the town. Inviting pedestrian streets and cafe-filled squares give it a relaxing charm. A foundation of Nîmes' affluence was denim, a fabric that seems as American as apple pie. 
But the word denim actually means from Neem, Danim. In the early 1700s, Neem had a thriving textile industry, and it needed a reliable source of water to power its mills and help dye its famous fabric. To support its denim producers, the city built an extensive system of industrial canals, which was ornamented with a lavish Versailles-type park. This happened just 50 years after the construction of the King's Palace at Versailles. And to the French, this people's place has a special significance. These were the first grand gardens designed not for royalty, but for the public. Nîmes is an hour's drive from the sunny Côte du Rhône region. Here you'll follow one of France's favorite wine roads, weaving through a rustic landscape carpeted with vines and peppered with warm stone villages. The lovingly tended vines of the Côte du Rhône, grown on the Côte or hillsides of the Rhône River Valley, make wines that are delightful on your palate, yet easy on your pocketbook. Traveling in May, we see the selection of just the best spring shoots on these gnarly old vines. This region was first planted with grapes by the Greeks around 600 BC. Romans built upon what the Greeks started, realizing even back then that here in Provence, the stony soil, mild winters, and long hot summers were ideal for producing great wine. Now we get to the good part. Are you ready? Get your wine glass. Oh, we're gonna do right. wine tasting. We're gonna actually do a wine tasting, not just a drinking. So we have, we, I put this list on the Facebook oh, page. Good. And Gabe is putting it in the um, chat. Yep. You want to talk about that? So uh, the Cote, I mean, it, it was it, in the last five, six, seven years, the Cote de Rhone area has become much better respected for its white wines. That's why we wanted to start with this. The This is a region, thank you. Um, and and I, used, I used to say in the book, I just drink rosé instead of white wine in Provence. And that still works because it's usually warmer, drier down there. And rosé is a lovely wine to have when it's warm outside. But boy, their whites are, have become really, really lovely. And they're always a blend. Um, uh, and the, in unlike in Burgundy or in Alsace, where the wine is 100% of that grape, you know that. Uh, in, in Provence, they commonly use anywhere up to 13 or 14 different grapes. They can choose from 31 different grapes, I was told when I was there. But usually there's they choose five or six different grapes for uh, for many, most of these wines and they're blends in, in other words. Here I'm gonna give you mm. this because so what is the first thing we do when we taste a wine? We look at it. We raise it up and you want it you want to see that it you can tell if, if a wine is turned, a white wine in particular, because it'll have sort of a golden, a, a burned look to it. Okay. And I just had a bunch in my cellar in Burgundy that had turned during COVID, because okay. you can't keep a white wine very long. And these were 2015 or 16s, and, and it's a, a disappointing, but you could just tell by the color. Okay. And it, it wasn't even worth tasting, right? Okay. And I always grab it by the stem. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a personal thing of mine, my tour members know this, because you'll warm the glass up by holding it like this, which may not be the end of the world view, but you also smudge it. So it just doesn't look as nice. And yep. it's easier to swirl like this too, okay, right? Okay, so I'm gonna swirl on and the you table. Can, you can do it that way. Because I wanna get that tornado of flavor headed towards Go girl, the tornado of flavor. And you really do wanna aerate it. There's there's a guy I worked with in, in, in this, this was in the South who suggested opening a red wine in the morning because you want to create oxygen, you want to expose the wine to oxygen, right? And and for dinner, he to and pour it in a glass. And that, he was a wine steward. That I know, I've I know. I that that's either. new to me, but it shows you how important it is to oxygenate to get oxygen in the wine. And then, ah, oh, it's the nose. A really good wine. You don't don't even have to drink it. Then if the nose is lovely, it's just delightful. Just this is nice too, don't you think? Mm -hmm. You think I do. And, it's a little floral. The the the, the first lesson in, in in giving somebody a wine tasting or that I learned from somebody in the states really is nobody can tell you what you like. Yes. And it's you don't have to like red wine. You don't have to, or you don't have to like this grape. Find the grape combination you like. And the lovely thing about France is it varies by every region. You will not find many Burgundy wines in Bordeaux or Bordeaux wines in Burgundy in restaurants. Of course, you can find them in wine stores, but but they you drink locally. It's mm -hmm. just that is just without question assumed. 
right? And anyway, and so we got the, we swirl, we oxygenated, get a sense of the nose. You like you it? Preview, I do. Mm -hmm. And also people use all of these really fancy words to describe why I said, oh, it's a little floral. Yeah. I could have easily have just said, mm, it smells like white flowers or I get a little pear. Um, yeah. It's it's like art. It's I agree with you on the pear, by the way. That's a good call. And a little peach. And that's common in a, in a Provencal wine, in a wine from the, the Cote de Rome. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, it's it's a bit hokey sometimes. I mean, but I it's fun. Yeah. You don't have to take yourself hopefully seriously or the next person, but what, and it's when somebody does a, a relaxed wine tasting, you can, you can learn, oh yeah, that's true. I, I get the almonds mm -hmm. or I get whatever. And that's just, I mean, you're, you're, you're tasting something that's going in your mouth. It's nice to know more about it. Yeah. So shall we? Yeah. Okay. So we've, we've done this and then you just want to just take a little sip and you want it just through the front of your mouth. Mm. Mm hmm. I didn't do it very well either. It's a little bit like gargling, but just a little bit. And you want to just kind of go through and just feel it really in the front of your mouth mostly, because that's where most of your, apparently, I'm talking as if I really am an expert. Well, that's this. why I brought you here. I'm, <laughs> I know what I like. Uh, it, yeah. Okay. We have more wines to taste. So okay. we like Shut this. up, Steve. No. Well, okay. So <laughs> you swirl it to aerate it. You sniff it to preview mm -hmm. it. And then you taste it, and you want you're talking about having it on the front of your mouth. You can do this, um, the aerating in your mouth, the slurping. Um, but one of the things we were talking about before is I asked you if I get a bottle of wine at a restaurant, mm -hmm. should I go through this whole thing? And you had a definitive answer on that. Everything but the slurping part. Okay. Because you're doing that in part because mostly we don't have a crochet here or something to spit into, because you do that kind of gross thing <laughs> or funny thing, and then you spit it out. Um to really get this. I've never done that. I, I've heard about that. I know. <laughs> but in a restaurant, you you would want to look at the wine, make sure the color is okay, and um, and 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 go through. And usually, you're going to like the wine. But I want to sort of um, encourage people. Is that the word? Liberate people to if you don't like it, it particularly if the waiter recommended it, um, if it doesn't suit your taste or you think it's bad, don't hesitate to say that's not good. The same thing in the states. Same thing anywhere you are. Generally, that's not the case, and we're intimidated to say anything anyway. But yeah, don't suffer in silence. There, there are wines that are, that that I've had that a waiter recommended, and I and and they're cool about it. They get it. They actually respect you more. That isn't what I was waiting. You don't say the wine's bad. Mm -hmm. That you you can say it in English too, because you're this is too complicated in French. Obviously, um, this isn't what I was thinking or what I was hoping for. Okay, that's and that's why France was the language of, of diplomacy for hundreds of years. It wasn't what I was expecting. That's so much more polite than I don't know. Oh, can I say, uh, I I just so much I love when I sit down for dinner and and the 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 first thing that the waiter or waitress the server will say to you is qu'est-ce que vous ferez plaisir? Qu'est-ce que vous ferez plaisir? What would make you? What would please you? Isn't that a lovely way to introduce yourself? What will make you happy? What will give you pleasure? What? Foot rubs. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so lovely. But so you know, I, I listen and I buy myself in these restaurants, right, Lisa? And I and I and I know most the Americans when the waiter or waitress says this to them, they don't understand it. But it's such a lovely thing. It's a shame to be missed. But anyway, listen, Chloe. Okay. This is fun. We have another, we have two more wines after this. When, so. when you, Provence is a great place to wine taste, by the way. It's a fun mm -hmm. place. It's relaxed. Generally, they're free in the Northern and Bo Burgundy and Bordeaux forget free probably, but that's okay. It's almost easier. I think when they charge where then you don't feel guilty because right. you can't buy 10 bottles or whatever it is that you, that would make them feel like their time's worth it. But um, in Provence, it's very, they make a lot of wine in Provence. It's a huge wine producing area. And so they're trying to get the name known. And so by free tastings, that's a way of doing so. We have our first question since we're um, mm. talking about this. Um, and I'm just going to, since mm -hmm. it was just a few days ago, what do you do to celebrate Bastille Day? Well, was, uh, I, I was you were back. on an airplane. Weren't I you? was or, virtually just yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. So my village um, in celebrating Bastille Day, they have a little festival in our village. And 
So we're in a valley of about five or six, seven different villages, and there'll be one every year that does the party for the valley. Mm -hmm. right? And it starts, or, I mean, they start setting up the night before, and it's cute. They have a little fishing contest. They'll put the old, the, the, the medieval um, wash basins where the women fill them with trout, little baby trout. I remember my son caught one there. He was so excited. And then it, and then it, they have games that are played for the kids in the day. And then at night, it turns into a disco. And if your house is right on the little square like ours is, you're staying up with the disco people. So, and, and they do fireworks too. They did phenomenal fireworks across the canal from our house. In cities, it, like in Paris, it's a huge deal, of course. I mean, people hey, go to the Eiffel Tower for the fireworks, of course. But there are dances the night before. Commonly, the big deal about the 4th of July is the 13th. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. You were waiting for me to say that. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> who throws these? These balls, Steve. The firemen, That's the fire departments. Yes, you have to be in a big enough city. We don't have a fire department in our <laughs> village. <laughs> yeah, so it's it is a uh, and the French aren't rowdy that much, but boy, they they can get that way at those balls, and it's good fun. It's a release. Yeah. Okay, let's turn the video back on for a few okay. minutes, and then we will get under our next wine, mm -hmm. and then we'll have our next one. Yeah. The French eat long and well, especially here in the south. Relaxed, tree-shaded lunches, long dinners, and lazy afternoons at outdoor cafes are the norm. The French have a legislated 35-hour work week and, it seems, a self-imposed 30-hour eat week. Provence has been called France's garden market. Salads are popular. Provençal cuisine loves garlic, olive oil, and herbs. Order anything a la Provençal and you'll be well rewarded. Laid-back lunches often come with a chilled rosé. The blush wines are considered refreshing. They can be very good and are respected here along with whites and reds. Rosé, now this, Ro Provence is the home of rosé. It is, right? yeah. Oh, okay. Sort of ground zero for it, yep. Yeah. So I, I have get, some rosé. I gotta get us something to pour. Oh, you just finished yours, okay. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> not very polite of you to Good point thing. that out. I'm not Steve. driving the ferry home tonight. That's right. Somebody else is doing that for me. Mm. Okay. So this was, um, this is a wine. It's made by a winery called Dune and it's called Gris, G-R-I-S, which means gray, doesn't right. it? Mm -hmm. But it's Sable de Camargue and the Camargue is a beautiful, interesting, marshy land in the south of Provence, where they have real cowboys mm -hmm. and, a, and mosquitoes that should be lassoed and put away. Um, so we are going to have this, this rosé. And it is really, so the rosé is really from Provence. It's where, when you're talking about drinking a rosé, if you're in another part mm -hmm. of France, you're going to buy a rosé from Provence. Is that right? Well, Every region makes a rosé now, even in the Alsace does too in the north. And even, even in Champagne, they make a rosé champagne, right? Yeah. And Bouvray makes a rosé. Yeah. A bit, but uh, it is the um, uh, sort of quintessential place to start. And, and the thing about rosé wines, Americans, I think, are getting, I think, at least in Seattle, it's becoming uh, popular to here to drink rosé in the summer when it's warm. Um, and they're dry not sweet, well, usually dry. Mm -hmm. They can be sweet, but the good ones are dry, I think. And they, they there's a trend to make them almost colorless. Have you noticed this? At least in France it is. And it's they can put as much color as they want into it. It doesn't affect the taste, it depends. But um, I like it like this color. I like to see the rosé color. Mm -hmm. It's just perfect, mm -hmm. it's blush, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm I, not gonna pour such a big pour this the, time. That was maybe a mistake on so my part. So one, when, when you're at a restaurant and you're ordering something, you can ask the waiter their opinion of what wine they would suggest. And not, not so much, it doesn't mean, would it be red, white, or, or uh, rosé? And a lot of times in Provence, they'll suggest a rosé with a meat course. Why not? Yeah, because some of the rosés are, are more substantial. Hmm. I was going to say something, but now I've lost it. So, okay. um, yeah, no. But we do, we wanted to also let you know that we brought out some food. So we have oh, yeah. the, oh, I know what it was, the quintessential baguette, right? Which if you remember the other show that we did on France, when poor Steve could not be with us mm. um, on the Dordogne, Julianne taught us how to cut it on its side mm -hmm. like that. So the bread doesn't get squished. And so we have baguette and then we have oh, a right. tapenade, right? So a uh, chopped olives and little peppers 
and other things I anchovy like. seriously oh i love it yeah oh yeah that's know. oh yeah oh yeah well, I'm not opposed to anchovies. I didn't know. Mm. Um, Nor normally tough, I do. You might also, you will also see this in Provence in a black version, just made with different. Most are they not. made with the Nicoise olives? Or just the tanche, black? yeah. The, it's called the tanche olive, and the Pichon, and those are the two main olive types. Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we have some goat cheese, which um, is important. Steve told me when, because he sent me to the store to buy all these things. Um, as my guest, I was happy to do that for him. And so he said, get a goat cheese because goat cheese is the most Provencal, but don't get a squishy young goat cheese. A creamy get, one. Yeah, don't. Yeah, get uh, a more aged one. And the reason I said that is because that's, they use in Provence, because we're talking Provence tonight. The, the it's, a, it's a drier aged goat cheese that they like that goes better with herbs and, and the uh, traditional cuisine. Do you, the have the red, do you have the red picks? Yes. Oh, they're behind. So we have some cheese. We can do that. Yes, the cheese. And I know what it was I wanted to ask. So did you notice how effectively I opened this bottle of wine? Mm -hmm. mm. A screw top wine is now not an indication of poor quality. Mm. It's very practical. And so you'll see that more and more. But Steve also wanted to talk oh. about the proper equipment that you would need well, if it was not that. a screw top. This is a real wine full, a good one. Um, a heavy, this one's made in France, but it doesn't have to be. Right? Laguiol, they make, um, it looks like laguiol. They make knives most most commonly, but but a, 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 a wine pull like this that has a cut so you can get rid of the, uh, the, the um, covering over the top of the wine. Mm -hmm. What's that called? There's a name for that? Yeah. Uh, it'll but, come to me. Yeah, it'll come to me too. Uh, get rid of that. And then a good foil. Foil. That's it. Thank you. Madame, merci beaucoup. A good wine pull with two levels to pull from that really allows you, because some wines are tough to pull out. And the bat wings, well, okay. No, those are horrible. I'm not a big fan. They work. No, the ones that. But go these are. This, this, up, no, it's it's are a funny thing. It's just a better feeling. This is a series. A, anyway, a good, this shape of a wine cork. Yes. Uh, pull. Yeah. And there's fancy ones too. Uh, but anyway. The other mm. thing I wanted to say, so I wanted to talk about the screw top. Also, when you're in Provence, um, you might actually be served your rosé with a little bit of ice on the side. Because I know some of our friends out there are suffering with the heat. Um, so I wanted to talk about temperature and wine because oh. it's not unusual or bad to put a glass of a cube or two of ice in your rosé. Um, the other thing is now you don't necessarily um, need to bring your red wine to complete room temperature because when the room temperature rule came to being, everybody's houses were a bit cooler. So room temperature was more like 68, 69. And now a lot of our houses are 73. And so you can chill your red wine just a little bit. Um, but then Steve was also mentioning about his friend, the steward who opens his red wine in the morning unless it's sit out all day. Well, not in summer temperatures. Yeah, that's, that's it. Is, by the way, uh, the, and these, the, the one tour, the one tour I did was almost a wine tasting tour from North. We were started in Champagne and ended in, uh, in one of our Rick Steve's tours. I love that tour. Uh, we ended in, in Provence uh, and we tasted in um, Champagne. We tasted in Alsace. We tasted in Burgundy. Oh, did we taste in Burgundy? And we tasted in Provence. And to a person, the big deal is global warming. Things are changing in the wine world, and that's like the canary, I think, in the mine shaft, uh, as if as if we needed it, right? But boy, our um, our things, our great choices, changing in areas. You talked about terroir before, you know. Mm -hmm. The notion of terroir is what grows the soil. It's all about the soil, the land that the French venerate. Whether oh, yeah. it's with wine, mm -hmm. whether I mean, the, there's a whole system of of wine, appellation contrôlée, and now it's called protégé. Um, well, this is new yeah, because it's the European Union, it doesn't matter. It, it, yeah, anyway, um, that the government can inspect and know that certain norms are being held to, uh, adhered to. This is done with cheese. This is done with all sorts of other foods as well. As and it's all to so that the customer can be assured that they are it has that label of approval. Um, now, why did I tell you that? There was a reason for that. Global warming. And yes, and, and so yes, and matching. Thank you. I'm here for you. Meh. 
God bless you. <laughs> I think I need you on my tour. Uh, uh, matching um, the, the so one 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 of our uh, winemakers said it's the 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 best Burgundy wines are the, they're going up the slopes. Mm -hmm. So the better vineyards are growing, growing up, going further up where it's cooler, right? Where the, the higher slopes to, to balance off with the dry, dry heat, uh, warmer summer, longer summers. So we're, so when you are talking about, um, okay, we're, we, we're all over France, even though we're supposed to be talking about Provence. Mm -hmm. So in Burgundy, you have the coat or the slope of the hillside. Right. And are you telling, and, and there's a more prestigious part of the slope. Right. Are you telling me it was at the bottom and now it's moving towards it, the top? So the, the, the commonly the greatest place, I mean, it, it varies by wine region, but is right in the saddle, right? Okay. Not in the flat part, but just as it slopes up just a little bit, but that's moving up. That's what okay. I'm telling you okay. to, you could say higher, more steep slopes, mm -hmm. but I think mostly for a change in climate more than anything else. The terroir remains the same, the soil, but the temperature and the climate is a little bit enough different that that's, um, Everywhere they're talking about this. They're making champagne in England now, the, the champagne people were saying, and uh, uh, and they should be. Yeah. So, okay. This is the rosé. I poured you a very teeny bit. Thank you. Bless I'm you. swirling. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't look. Mm -hmm. Okay. We saw the beautiful blush color in the bottle. It looks a little bit paler in the glass. Um, what are we talking about when we're talking about this term legs? I've heard people talk about legs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does that mean? That's if you. It, well, I'm looking at your legs, right? <laughs> that sounds funny. <laughs> I'm looking at the legs in your wine glass right now, um, and um, and it's it's it it helps you judge uh, the alcohol percentage in the wine. The slower and the more distinct they are, the more the heavier the alcohol percentage. And the French like a lighter alcoholic wine. Thirteen percent would be max, maybe thirteen five for the French. You'll see a lot of twelve, twelve and a half percent. Whereas in the States, in, Cal in Napa Valley, or in Australia in particular, places like that, it's 14, 15. 15. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, the legs are a way of judging. The, uh... This has almost no nose. And you can't irrigate in France, except for the first couple of years when you're planting new vines. You can't. Now know. that, they say, that may be changing now with the change in climate. But that's a big deal. And, there, and part of it is the wine... Uh, Grape, uh, grapes that are grown for table wine, for wine, uh, reach very far down in the soil and get their nourishment from very far down. So, and, and so generally you don't have to worry about it. Okay. All right. Let's get, let's drink our wine, but let's get back to the video. Show them those pretty pictures. Aix-en-Provence is the historic capital of the region. For a tourist, Aix is delightfully free of must-see museums or ancient ruins. It's simply a wealthy town. It's people known for living well and looking good. Aix's university gives the city a youthful energy. Centuries ago, the king made Aix the district's administrative center. Noble French families moved in, kicking off the city's beautiful age, or Belle Epoque. They lined the streets with private mansions, giving Aix its classy appearance. Aix thrived thanks to its aristocratic population. But when the revolution came and the bust of the king on the city hall was replaced by Marianne, the Lady of the Republic, suddenly it became dangerous to be an aristocrat. The wealthy fled the city and Aix slumbered through most of the 1800s. But today, once again, it's resumed its trendy ways. The main boulevard, Cours Mirabeau, is designed for the rich and famous to strut their fancy stuff. It survives much as it was, narrow for traffic and very wide for pedestrians who would promenade under their elegant mansions. Yeah, I stopped. But I just wanted to add that street is now completely pedestrian only and it is incredibly wide and no cars. Thank you. And that's <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> that's absolutely And that's perfect. happening <laughs> and it's made and it, it it's happening everywhere in France where they're expanding on pedestrian only zones. And boy, in Aix-en-Provence, that's almost the whole city is pedestrian only. Cours Mirabeau remains the place for ton d'arts. That's trendiness. The French are world-class people watchers. Enjoy the show. In Aix's old town, inviting pedestrian streets hum with activity. Towns are particularly lively on market days. Good guidebooks list market days. And travelers who plan well enjoy the most vivid experience. X's Farmer's Market 
is a classic Provençal scene. Rustic farmers selling fresh produce under the shade of graceful plane trees. Freshness is everything in the Provençal cooking. Here's your garlic, oh, essential to Provençal <laughs> cuisine. You can cook without it. No way. And you have your herbs of Provence, oh, you have are... your dried sage, thyme, rosemary. We all set for cooking. Bonjour. Bonjour. Je vous fais goûter. Oh, oui. oh avec plaisir. This is goat cheese. Huh? In Provence, we have goat cheese, not cow's cheese. Huh. And it's not so strong. Mm. Mm. Okay. It is very good, delicious. Mm. It goes from mild to stronger in taste with age. C'est délicieux. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs> Au revoir. Au revoir. Oui, 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 got And Whoa. just beyond any market, you're likely to find the local gang playing boule. Boule is the horseshoes of southern France. It's played in every village on gravelly courts kept just for this purpose. Every French boy grows up playing boule. It's entertaining to watch, especially if you understand the rules. Boule is played with heavy metal balls, or boule, and a tiny target ball. Whoever gets their boule closest to the target ball scores. There are two on a team. One lobs the ball as close to the target as he can. The other tries to knock away the opponent's boule. Once all the balls have been launched and the attempted blasting is over, measurements are made. Whoever ends up with the ball closest to the target receives one point. The first to reach 13 wins. Between rounds, players are happy to let curious travelers give it a try. <laughs> okay, here we go, ready, here we go. Like, like so. Okay. The nearby city of... I just want to pause for one second. Um, and I wanted to say uh, two things. One, they are, they have little cloths in their hand because what they're playing on is dusty. So you shine your, your bull every time. And I also wanted to point out that um, you obviously have spent a lot more time in Aix-en-Provence than I have. Um, but one of the things that I think is particularly great about Aix in relation to all of these other Provencal cities is that Aix has different markets, different days of the week. So it's not just all food markets, there's book markets and cloth markets and, and house good markets. And I mean, that's important because unless you're in an apartment, a food market is just pretty, but not super practical. So, mm. but we're gonna talk about that. Don't jump ahead. We're gonna talk about renting apartments a little bit later. You wanna talk about Avignon? No. <laughs> Avignon is famous for its papal palace and its broken bridge. Contemporary Avignon prospers behind its mighty medieval walls. With its large student population and fashionable shops, Avignon is an intriguing blend of youthful spirit and sophistication. Its foreboding papal palace dominates the old town. Through most of the 14th century, the Catholic Church was run from here in Avignon. In 1309, the French-born Pope Clement V decided to move the papacy from Rome to Avignon. All of Europe recognized Clement as the legitimate Pope. During that period, Avignon grew from a quiet village to a powerful city. The church basically bought up the town and made it Europe's largest construction zone. It built its wall, mansions for cardinals, residences for the entire Vatican bureaucracy, vast public squares, and the Pope's towering palace. After about 70 years, a later Pope moved the papacy back to Rome. But Avignon installed its own rival pope, and for about 40 years there were two disputed popes, one in Rome and one in Avignon. Finally, in 1417, a church-wide council affirmed the Roman pope. Avignon dropped his claim, and what was called the Great Schism was over. This bridge is the Pont d'Avignon, made famous by the 15th century folk song known to all French school kids. On y danse, sur le pont d'Avignon, on y danse tous en rond. Avignon's famous bridge was vital for trade in the Middle Ages. While only a few arches survived, the bridge was huge, extending all the way to the lonely tower of Philip the Fair, which marked the beginning of France. Uh, but I, I don't feel like that story goes far enough, so I wanted to ask you, is... Why is there a song about it? And is that bridge important because it straddled the border of France? 
Well, it, it did. It was a border in the sense that um, it left the Catholic enclave that the popes ran for about 100 years or close to it into the rest of France, if you want to say that. The, no, the biggest part of that bridge was a rare crossing over the Rhone River. Okay. Uh, it was, that's the bigger deal. And in the 1100s, that was an accomplishment. And it's hard to tell by the images, but that's an island in the middle. And then there's an, the river split. The Rhone is huge. And, and, and the, um, the, the flow of it varies so much, depending on the season, right? If it's melt off time. And that bridge had to be strong <laughs> to withstand the flow of the Rhone River. Uh, which it wasn't strong enough, obviously, when it, it, the last, they would rebuild it and they'd rebuild it again. I think the early 1600s was when they said, the heck with this, we're done rebuilding this thing. Oh, really? But the strategic event, just a crossing for Avignon, partly the, the, the Pope's, uh, the importance of the Pope's area that they controlled, just the, really the city of Avignon and up to Chateauneuf du Pape. So it's just this little area that they, the Pope's controlled that you can call it the Vatican of uh, Southern France. Um, it, it the importance was more for trade because that okay. allowed that that's what really kept uh, Avignon was not particularly important compared to Arles or Nîmes during the Roman era, but it certainly became important thanks to the bridge in part in the Middle Ages. Okay, so I just want to finish up. I really like this rosé. It has dry. It's nice. Not much of a not much of a nose, but it's very dry. It has a good flavor. But you need to finish yours because we have to do one more wine before we finish tonight. One thing about Provencal wines, too, is astonishing when you go in a store, and you should if you're traveling to Provence, go into a market, and for three or four euros, you can find a perfectly good, I'm serious, red or white wine or rosé. Now, double that, and you'll do a lot better, but still. Um, and don't be surprised if it's a really light colored rosé because they are, it's sort of a trend now. Okay. Okay. Under red, is that what you want? We're gonna get there, we're gonna do a little bit more video. Like Nîmes, Industrial Avignon was thoroughly water powered. Its river was split into canals to drive water wheels which powered the town's 19th century factories and textile mills. This street of the dyers is charming. Its limestone car barriers are carved whimsically by amateur sculptors. Avignon retains its quaint industrial age souvenirs, but its sleek new train station, which welcomes France's bullet train, is a good example of how France is embracing modern technology and investing in public transportation. The 180 mile an hour TGV trains now put the south of France less than three hours from Paris. No, I'm gonna talk about it, Steve. Hmm. <laughs> um, I, I, we both were just like itching because this is such a good tip. Um, Avignon, like Aix-en-Provence, has have TGV stations that are outside of the centers of town. So they're a fantastic place to pick up or drop off a car. So you're not driving into the city. I almost got divorced once driving into Avignon proper. <laughs> um, I still to this day have not seen parts of Avignon. because I thought you were going to say you haven't seen your husband. <laughs> no, no we, we said no to Avignon and yes to the marriage, but it was iffy for a few minutes um, going around those narrow streets. Yeah. So, and when we turned in our car uh, on a different trip in uh, at the Avignon TGV station, it was the friendliest uh, business exchange I've it's ever good. had with a French person. And it was so easy. So you really do want a car for Provence. If you don't, you want to base yourself in Avignon because that's where all the good day trip companies are out of. Generally, you'll tell me if I'm wrong. Am yeah, I, I would never tell you wrong. I uh, For day tripping, um, Avignon is probably the single best base because of public transit too. It's it's the best from Avignon. But also I, what I wanted to say about the, those trains, the TGV trains to our viewers, book it early. Mm -hmm. Get on the SNCF Connect website. It's easy to do. The fares are really reasonable. And if you're 60 or older, you get a, you can, you, and if you're traveling, it's better than your all pass now. This is the big news. If, and a lot of our uh, travelers are 60 or over. Um, you pay 44 euros and anybody's qual anybody qualifies. You don't have to be a European and you get a senior card. And that gives you 50%, about 50% off, 30 to 50 on any train trip. So if you're doing several train trips, it takes one train trip to save that the 44 euros you paid for, and it's valid a year. So it's a swinging deal. So what's it called in French? The Carte Advantage Senior. It's in the book. Okay, it's the in new, the book. Mm -hmm. The book. 
Oh, yep. we're going to talk about that. At the and, from our sponsor. and but probably for most people, more importantly, book that TGV party. The, the local trains you don't have to worry about. But boy, book that TGV trip early. I concur. And I'm less a fan of rail passes. I don't know about you, Lisa. And you know much about that because they the, the French rail pass limits the reservations for rail pass users where I can get a TGV seat and you can't if you have a rail pass and I don't. That's just rude. <laughs> it's true, but rude. But anyway. Yes. So I uh, also concur that um, the advanced purchase discounts for TGV mm, for yes. high-speed trains, you know, you good buy call. 30, 60 days in advance, you'll really good save call. some money. Very good call too. And if for some reason yeah. you're traveling in a group of eight or more, if you have two families traveling together, you can get a group rate. And I think that I paid, now this was 2016 when I did this with two families, mm. but we paid with kids something like 18 euro per person to go from Avignon to Paris. And if we had walked up and bought a single ticket, we would have been 180, something like that. Yep. So we really saved a lot of money. Yep. Okay, you're going to pour the Gigondas and oh, we'll baby. a little bit more yeah. video. Okay. Not too much. And the freeways are doing their best to keep up the pace. In France, like almost anywhere in Europe, the fastest way from A to B is the auto route or freeway. French auto routes come with tools, but if you're in a hurry, they easily save enough time to justify the expense. But of course, slow roads come with more memories. To be all alone with your own personal Roman ruin, take a quick detour to the aqueduct of Barbigal. These are the scant remains of an ancient Roman power station, channeling a river to turn their mills. The Romans ingeniously harnessed maximum power from the water flow. They built a series of terraced pools, allowing the water to cascade down, powering eight separate grinding mills. Romans grew wheat on these vast fields and brought the grain here to the mega water mill. Cutting through this bluff, the water from this aqueduct provided power to produce enough flour each day to feed 12,000 hungry Romans. The mill served the nearby Roman town of Arles, and that's where we're heading. But not yet. Uh, we're going to talk about, you want to talk about the aqueduct of Barbagol. I love that site. I love it as much as the Pont de Bar. Oh. Because nobody's there. And you crawl over the ruins of an aqueduct. And he, you saw the channel at the end. It is, I love, first of all, that's, I'll show my cards. I love evocative ruins. Uh, I love seeing the Pont de Garde, obviously. But seeing the Barbagol aqueduct. Um, and you can walk in a field. You walk through it. You can walk up. You can climb up top of it. Uh, it's very um, well evocative, and I uh, it, it's easy to get to. It's just outside of Arles. And off the beaten path. And indeed, it's between Arles and Les Beaux. So most people are going from Arles to Les Beaux, the hill town. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll talk about that. We could talk about it now. If we good. don't have any video, but I have a, Les Beaux is one of my favorite places. It's a hill town outside of, of, of Arles, and it's the... It's, it's a popular place, so go early or go late, and the aqueduct is halfway there. It's right on your way. And if it's hot out, there is an old quarry where they used to mine bauxite, yep. that which they get the name, Le Beau, B-A-U-X, bauxite, um, that every year they take a theme, an art theme, and they project art all over the ceiling mm -hmm. and the floor and the walls because it's all this white quarry. And Honestly, if you go in the summer, it's fabulous because it's always about 58, 62 degrees in there, naturally air conditioned, and um, they have music with it. And that's uh, the one year I went with the families that we're talking about was Italian Renaissance masters. So that I could see the Sistine Chapel ceiling only 10 feet above me and projected hugely. It was just fabulous. These are vast quarries, though. They're, they're, a lot of the rooms are 50, 60, 70 feet high. Mm -hmm. And the the theme of the show varies every year, changes every year. So maybe it's Van Gogh one year and Matisse, the, whatever. Uh, it's worth knowing what's going on there too. And what what did the uh, bauxite lead to? Oh, I don't know. Ooh, aluminum. Oh. That's where aluminum comes from. Yes, yes. How do you mean? Can you extrapolate? Out of, no, I'm not. Out of the <laughs> mineral of bauxite, we got aluminum. Oh, <laughs> I hope I'm right about that. I've been around before. Tell us in the comments. If yeah, I hope they do. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so we talked about Lebo. And we wanted to, you talked about Barbigal. I love that. Right? Little, yeah. And it's right on the way to Lebo. And Lebo, again, one more time. It is, we do it. I was happy with the walking tour. We do so many, we go to a lot of effort in these books to, to put you in the place of turn left here and turn right here. And it's up to you to, to do what you want, but to give you 
good inside tips on visiting this these places. And I think we do the the one in Lebo, our tour works really well. And it's a great place to go early or late in the day, but it's slammed in the middle day. Yeah. So you could go if you went there midday, you could do the bauxite quarry where mm -hmm. it's cool and then segue into the open air museum. The Carriere de Lumière, it's called. Yeah, but no, what's the oh, thing sorry. with the the stocks where they lived? You can explain that better you mean than the, I can. The castle on the top of the hill. Yes. Yeah. The old, the, the dead city they call it. the old, the old city yeah. at the top of the hill. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, Great. it's amazing. With kids. It is also in, in many of these places. When you go to these places, by the way, particularly in Provence, really more so there than ever. Wear good shoes and don't expect to be warned of slippery or uneven footing. The, you know, if you fall, it's your own damn fault, according to French law, right? It says, uh, says it exactly. It, and boy, I'm uh, as I get as I get older, I am evaluating sites much more based on on how uneven the footing is, and I see people struggling a little bit, and not just Americans by any means. So that's one place to pay attention. Okay, you want to try the wine really quick? No, oh, this is so. This is Gigondas. Um, this is after Chateauneuf du Pape in Provence wines the most revered of the, of the areas. It's a village. It's a lovely village, Gigondas is, uh, in Provence. It's, it's, and as a Chateauneuf du Pop, I actually prefer the village of Gigondas. And it makes, so the, in red wines in Cote d'Iron, which is really what they're most famous for. I mean, 90% of our, the Chateauneuf du Pop is about red wines. Sure, they make a white wine. They even make a rosé, but it's about their red wines. And the three most, I mean, the, if you're a hip American, it's all about GSM. You're going to hear this this expression. What's GSM. It's Grenache, Syrah, and Mouret. Oh. And and people yeah, think they're cool using those three letters, but you'll hear GSM, GSM a lot. So maybe in the States too. I, okay. I, I'm not much uh, What's... tasting. So those are the three principal grapes that they'll use in, in a Cote de Rome red wine. Okay. So, uh, and tell, tell me about the nose. Oh. Because the color is beautiful, the color is dark. We swirl. And, and consistent and some wines aren't filtered or less filtered that's okay but you definitely don't want a lot of sediment in your wine and you it's good to look at it through a light like the light that's above us we didn't do this earlier if well, you're doing this at home in the comments along with us let us know and look look now you can see my legs running down this is a bigger wine can you yes. see, you can you can see yes. now our viewers can't see this but it's kind of fun to pay attention you have to get it you know, oh yeah boy all that goes from Okay. Okay. I'm not getting too much. Now get your nose in there. Get yeah. Your... Mm -hmm. So I would say this has red a, weak, a weak nose. Yep. There are probably more um, substantial series. Oh, but it's classic Cote d'Iron. I mean, it, it is. I don't mind it. It just smells. It doesn't have a strong, maybe blackberry. Mm hmm. All right. Dark fruits, they'd say. Mm hmm. Very dark. And when you taste this, do that. Boy, do you get the the tannins. That's a finish. And the tannins. Uh, yeah, that's one reason you would open it earlier and aerate it longer but than we have. We've had this open for over two hours. But not in the glasses. Oh. Yeah, and helps. It yeah. helps to open the bottle. Yeah. But decanting it, mm -hmm. if it's a big wine, as a Gigondas is, um, it's not a bad idea to decant it so it has more chance to aerate. But... This is why we have to have the but... tapenade and the cheese and the bread. For me, because I think that this is a type of wine that deserves a pairing with some food. I... That's my opinion. The French generally don't judge a wine except to, to judge it by what this this would be good with this food this would be good with that food if they don't if they can't find a food that it would be good with that means they don't like the one then it's a bad one it's a, yeah all right on with the show by helping julius caesar defeat marseille the people of Arles earned the imperial nod and their city was made an important river port with its strategic bridge over the rhone river Arles was a key stop on the roman road from italy to spain after being a trading center for centuries, Arles became a sleepy town of little importance in the 1700s. Allied bombs destroyed much of the city in World War II, but today, Arles thrives again. This compact city is alive with Roman ruins, an eclectic assortment of museums, and welcoming pedestrian zones. It's my favorite home base from which to explore France's Provence region. Twice a week, Arles' ring road erupts into an open-air market of flowers, 
ready for ratatouille baskets of produce, and everything but car traffic. Join in, try the olives, sniff that lavender of Provence. The beauty of this market is its international flavor, reflecting how Provence remains a crossroads of Mediterranean cultures. Paella from Spain, fragrant mint leaves for tea, spices from North Africa. The market feels a little like a bazaar thanks to the many Algerians and Moroccans who call Arles home. Throughout France, but especially here in the south, Muslim North Africans from France's former colonies have come to pick olives, harvest fruit, and so on. While they are integrating, France is dealing with the friction any country has when immigrant laborers do its lowliest jobs. The Forum Square is named for the Roman Forum that once stood right here. This square was the political and religious center of Roman Arles. Still lively, it's just the place for a pastis. This is the traditional aperitif here in Provence. It's a mix or blend of anise and other herbs, and you cut it, dilute it according to taste. They serve it with a carafe of water. It's almost a tradition here, before meal, to get together with good friends and enjoy a pastis. We're staying at Hotel Calendal. The friendly staff speaks English, not unusual here in Provence. Its rooms are quiet and comfy, and many come with views. Guests enjoy internet access, an enticing breakfast buffet, and the shady Provençal chic courtyard. The Calendal provides just the mix of comfort and economy I look for when researching my guidebooks. Okay, so I just wanted to stop and talk about the Calendal because one of the things that I think that France still does so well are these small family-run budget hotels. They're getting harder and harder to find in other places. I don't know if you just read Cameron's blog about the the demise of B&Bs in England, but the French still seem to be doing this and they still seem to be doing it in a very budget friendly way. France outside of Paris is a pretty affordable destination. Great. Great. And I wanted to give my two cents because I am a big hotel fan. Yeah, Airbnb is okay. It, there's some ethics that come into it. But for me, if I'm staying somewhere for one, two or three nights, it's got to be a hotel because you cannot underestimate how valuable just a hotel sign is when you're taking a taxi in from the train station or the, the airport and you want to find your hotel. It's so much easier to find a hotel that's signed as opposed to being dropped off in front of the wrong apartment or Airbnb because that's only happened to me twice. Um, and you are the king of finding these hotels. So you also just wanted to well, add something briefly. Uh, there are so many advantages hotels offer, I agree, that, that the Airbnbs don't. And then there's that issue of Airbnbs starting to dominate certain neighborhoods of cities where they become more tourist ghettos that aren't real anymore. So that somehow, and the French are, they're good at controlling this kind of thing. Paris has already really cut back on Airbnb. So I don't worry about it too much in Paris, whereas maybe in Venice and other cities in Europe, you might worry about it. Um, but the, the really, the advantage of a hotel has nothing to do with worrying about the ethics of Airbnb. You have somebody to check in with a map of the city. If you want help getting that, a big part of your trip is getting that restaurant that you want. I'm not talking about a Michelin starred restaurant. It may be 25 euros for your menu for the night, but you liked what I said in the book or the, what Rick had to say in the book. The hotel can call and book that table for you again sometimes just um the day of and it's not easy to talk on a french telephone on a, it, for a lot of americans and i'm not sure how well their cell phones work in this kind of thing so hotels and they provide services calling a taxi for you if your uber doesn't show up and ubers are very good in big cities in france and that's like about four and after that, they really tail off. So you're working with cabs after that. So you're speaking French and you're not on your phone anymore for the most part. Anyway, you can imagine if your air conditioning doesn't work, there's somebody at that desk. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Am I right? Am I right? You are so right. Okay. And then- And we, I love this hotel. 
I just, it's so I lovely. Love it comes with the internet access. Did you see? No, I saw that. I think that it was, was an good. Apple product. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, so we had one last mm. tip that we wanted to share with them um, before we do want to have some time for yeah. questions. I know that especially we want to address some current events. So okay. um, we're going to wrap up with a video that oh. Steve took. Um, and I'll, and actually you can talk over this one. So okay. let me let me get to that. While you're looking, can I introduce it or should I wait for yeah, you? Yeah, no, go ahead. This Thank is you. from my village. It was July um, 3rd in our village in, in, in Burgundy, in southern part of Burgundy, where in um, July 3rd, 1943, and our village is 150, 200 people, by the way, um, a, a Royal Air Force, a British airman, plane of six people, a bomber on a bombing mission okay. was shot down. Okay. Pause. And now you want to keep talking? You have about a minute and a half of this video. Just this is this is an, an annual event, and this is the 80th anniversary of this event because it was in 1943. The villagers in the hills behind that you can see that's our little town square in our village came up when they, they saw the plane shot down in occupied France at that point. Germans all around and um uh, um under I mean, dangerous um conditions pulled the bodies out and buried them. And they are buried in our village cemetery. And every year, the uh, to honor those six airmen who died trying to liberate France is honored. And here is this year's. And I just want to point out um, how nice it was when you showed me this video that this young girl, who's probably the age of my yeah. daughter, maybe a few years older, she's involved in this as well. So mm -hmm. there's anything else you want to add? Oh, they, this is the Marseillaise part. OK. Yeah. Oh no, it's playing its backdrop. Okay, that's what's happening. All right, yes. So every year, the, the fellow in the khaki suit is is represents the Royal Air Force um, from England, um, with the mayor of the village, and then the county um, commissioner. Those are the three people you see. There. County commissioners in blue. Women are running the show, by the way, France these days, and mayor in villages like ours, and then the Scottish bagpipers that serenaded us as we walked up to the city. Okay, so this is edited. So, yeah. yeah, so in a second, we're good. gonna show you walking up to the grave. Okay, good, yeah. So this is- Mars So everyone sang, everyone sang the French National Anthem. Right. Uh, the, um, it's hard to hear. The, um, my point on this is throughout France, they haven't forgotten. This is 80 years ago. We're coming on the 80th anniversary of D-Day next year. It's a big deal to the French today. Not just in the village I live in, but everywhere you go, these celebrations, they haven't forgotten that their country is liberated by Canadians, Americans, Brits, and others. And this is us walking up to our village cemetery where the rest of the ceremony took place. I, I, honestly, I think the entire village came out for this. And yes, it's an older village like many are. Although they're getting younger these days with the ability to work remotely. You can hear the bagpipers. Isn't that nice? They sang the French I'm National not, Anthem I, at the monument, and now they're doing the bagpipes and y'all can check it It was powerful. And you're to see my dad, you guys. You can see dad in a second here. I think it, this is, there he is. That's dad. Almost 98. Go, dad. Hmm. He's been doing that celebration for 30 years. I don't know that he's missed many of them. Okay, so. Um, Thank you, Lisa. You're very welcome. Thank you for sharing that with mm -hmm. us. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share and I'm just going to do a word from our sponsor now that I'm all choked up. We have mentioned this fabulous book many times this evening. Um, I, as a, a person with a family, always appreciate Steve's hotel selections because he always lets us know if they're good family rooms. Yes. I think Thank that's you. one of the things that makes this book shine so brightly. Um, and I just appreciate your hard work that you and Rick do for all of us readers out there. And I would just say this is just updated, right? It came out yeah. last. So this is post COVID lockdown. So all good information. And then whenever you buy this book, you can always go to our website and you can see the guidebook updates and we'll put fresh out of the rucksack information there as well. So thank you, Steve, Provence guidebook author. And now we have some questions. Um, I want to get to something that's been on a lot of people's minds. 
Let's see, where is it? Um, Kathy wants to know, what are Steve's thoughts about the current unrest in France? And I would break that down into there has been some racial unrest that mm -hmm. was very explosive mm -hmm. very recently, but has since died off pretty substantially. Mm -hmm. But then there were the strikes about the working week before that, and that's still ongoing. It's my understanding. So what do you what do you know about that? What do you think about that? No, the uh, the strikes that have to do. I mean, there's little things, but they've they pretty much absorbed the uh, working till 64. That's pretty much a done deal. What happened recently in Paris, well, re when I was just before we left, uh, about the police shooting of a young African, uh, North African, uh, I think he was Tunisian, um, is a big deal because gun violence in France is really rare compared to the United States. So when it happens, it's a big deal, but this is hardly the first time. And it's, Americans will relate to this. It's very much the same issue that we've, we've faced we're faced with um, how police react to people who look differently than they do, nece not necessarily than all of them, but um, for us as travelers, it makes the news. I don't see a thing. The same thing, by the way, I mean, if you were in Paris during the the, the, the longer term um, resistance of the strikes during the, um, the eight, re raising the age of retirement, mm -hmm. We didn't see a thing in the small towns, nothing. And I mean nothing. In Paris, there was some trash on the streets because people went to, and the metros on strike some days of the week. We were running tours throughout that time. And yeah, certain days we had to grab taxis or buses when the, when the subway wasn't working. But like anywhere, it's usually much more um, uh, blown up in the news than it really is. That, that said, it is important, and France is struggling, and I think that's an important issue and a good question from her. I, they have serious issues to resolve, as, as we do in the United States, with how they deal with the North Africans, and, and it's a big, it's a huge deal in France because these are colonies. These people have the right to be in France, and they are um, they're coming north from North Africa for a better life. And this is particularly... Um, happening also in southern France because that is the closest port. Right? Correct. I mean, the, the one thing we haven't talked about, it, it's a funny thing, and I noticed in, in, in that TV show, Marseille is a part of Provence, but we don't, oh, true. we didn't, in his TV show that I was giving Lisa our time about because it's a little bit old. Yeah, Marseille is the, I mean, oh, I think 20% of the population, at least in Marseille, doesn't speak French, right? It's huge, and that bothers certain French people. And it is the port of arrival. You're absolutely right, Lisa. It also makes a terrifically fun and exhilarating city to visit. I don't, I mean, I don't want to be out in dark alleys anywhere at night in big cities. In Marseille, I pay more attention to than other cities at night. But I mean, as a day trip or yeah, spending the night staying in logical areas, you're, it is a brilliant city. I really had a really great visit to Marseille. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. All right. Okay. Susan has a, a question. What is the best place to uh, the best place to home base in Provence for a full week if you want to do slow travel? Do you have a car? She better have a car. Okay. If she, well, no, you don't need one. If you have a car, so so if you have a car and you don't need a city, and and and, and the by two virtue of mix, you don't the, want a car. You, so Saint Remy de Provence, Saint Remy is the most central and a lovely little town. That is so central to so many things. That's where I would suggest. Absolutely. I love other hill towns, but they're too removed. Basel Laramène, for example, um, they're, they're too far away. San Remy has a great Wednesday market and it's a beautiful city. And it's 20 minutes from Arles, 15 minutes from Les Beaux, 20 minutes from Avignon. So that, that's what I would, if, if I don't have a car, Avignon and Arles, those two cities. Mm -hmm. Um, but mainly I, Avignon. I would say, I don't want to, I like San Remy a lot. Mm. San Remy is very elegant. It's a little bit posh. Mm. It reminds me of Carmel. So my, and it has a lot of good restaurants, so I say that already, but my favorite place to home base, it's secret. Can we say this on yeah. there? Uh, it's a little village called Fontvieille, F-O-N-T-V-I-E-L-L-E. Um, has three really good restaurants. I was there in July and there was very few people speaking English. Um, good point. I I think it is a secret back door that doesn't get a lot of people and I would highly recommend it. And it's not that far. It's, it's not that far from Sour Me. Nope. So that's- Sour Me is better though. 
Okay. All right. See it is Sarah Mead. The problem is Bompier, I, mean, I won't get into that, but uh, it is, she's right about that. Bompier won't have many tourists and it's really well located. Yeah. It's a really good one. And if you happen to be there over Bastille Day, they do have a fantastic little parade through town with the Camargue Cowboys and they have the bull games. And um, the bull games are not the bull fights that you see in Spain, which I have not been to, I do not plan on going to, but the bull games are um, very athletic young men in an arena trying to grab a ribbon off the bull's forehead. And the bull is just like, it's a free for all for the bull to get to chase these men around. And the only way they can defend themselves is by actually jumping out of the ring. So they're very athletic, um, very local thing to do. There's no blood. Um, I think that that's something that people should know about. And Tombier does a good job with that, I agree. Let's see. Um, and Cecilia wants to know, what do the French think of American wines? They're getting, that's a, that's a good, they don't know much about our wines. The, the, the more they travel to the States though, the more they get to know our wines. They're, it's not easy to find American wines in France um, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, they are what I would say, the, the good question, 10 years ago, very skeptical, 15. Now, more and more aware of the, the blends we do, you know, particularly in the Northwest, we do good red blends. Um, and the Pinot Noirs from Northern California are very respected. From Oregon, you mean? No, from Northern, the, 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 the well, I, okay. <laughs> it, it's just, nobody can tell you what you like again. I, the, the Oregon Pinots are very good too, but those from the Russian River Valley are hard. And the French find them more similar. That's what I should say, rather than making judgment. Yeah. And from Santa Barbara County, remarkable. Yeah. But they have to have traveled, the French do, to, to have appreciated American wines, yeah. But it is, it is again, a much more favorable opinion than it used to be because they know it now. They're getting bit by bit to know it, our wines. Okay, and the last question is, um, what's a reasonable price for a good but affordable wine in France from Provence? I think we kind of touched on this, but... So I'm I'm so if you're in a restaurant, it's one thing, right? Thirty euros in a restaurant, twenty five. I never went over thirty euros. Well, thirty two maybe euros in a restaurant, um, and in a store, fifteen, ten, fifteen. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you can go less than that and have some fun trying them out. Um, but ten to fifteen is a good range to find a nice wine, a Cote de Rhone, white, red, or rosé. So this Chigondas from Total Wine was like thirty two dollars. The white Cote de Rhone and the, the rosé were both around $12. Good. And I thought that they were delightful. Mm -hmm. And um, please come back next week when our friend Ben is going to be um, hosting Pat O'Connor. And they're going to be talking about Northern Ireland. <laughs>